So I'm going to focus in now on these three steps, which is really where we interact quite heavily with librarians in the systematic review process. Formulate the review question, but I'm going to combine these two together because formulating that question and defining these inclusion and exclusion criteria based on the concepts, asking that question in an answerable format, are so closely linked. And this one, I'm actually going to split into two. I'm not talking about locating studies because we transition from asking that question into developing a search strategy. And then once we have our strategy right, we go and apply and actually search. So, beginning at step one, as I said, I'm going to address the question and this PICO mnemonic all together at this point, and then we'll talk about developing the search strategy and actually searching for the evidence. So the question, and the question is arguably probably the most important part of that entire process. The main reason being because it's the first step in the process. And if we don't step off on the right foot, then there could be trouble and problems all the way through the rest of those steps. So the aim of the question is really to provide a framework for the development and also the conduct of that review all the way through those steps in that process. And a good question supports the review, whilst a poor question risks confounding the review. And I'll give you some examples in a moment. So you will have heard of uh, systematic reviews or reviews of effects or effectiveness, which are what um, fuel the Cochrane Library and a lot of the, the Joanna Briggs, um, the JBI database of systematic reviews and implementation reports are these types of reviews. They focus on the effectiveness of an intervention or a therapy. Often that's used in medical practice, for example, but also in nursing practice and across allied health and through the health professions. Now this PICO mnemonic, which many of you as librarians will be clearly very familiar with, simply refers to the population, the intervention, the comparator, and the outcome. Sometimes you'll see that extended to PICOT, which may be also the types of studies, often the timing of an intervention, or sometimes PICOS, we refer to the study design. Um, but this same mnemonic, PICO, can also be used to guide moving from a question into eligibility criteria and being able to ask that question in an answerable format to reviews of qualitative and textual data. So we still refer to a PICO, but here we're referring to a population. And now, because we're talking about qualitative data, so this might be a question that's looking into the, the meaningfulness or how a patient experiences a particular intervention or therapy. And we talk here about a phenomena of interest rather than an intervention and a comparator. Or we also talk about the context. So we're not specifying any outcomes in particular. But I'll go into a bit more detail in just a moment. So here's an example question for a review that's looking into the effectiveness of an interventional therapy. And this is a really nice example of how we ask a question in an answerable format. This question here could be asked by a clinician standing in the ward, might be a doctor, might be a nurse, with a bottle of chlorhexidine in their hand saying, is it necessary? Do we need this stuff? Asking that same question in an answerable format would look something like this. Are antiseptic washes our intervention? More effective than non-antiseptic washes, our comparison might just be sterile water, at preventing nosocomial infections, our outcome, in patients undergoing surgery, our population. And instantly, we've conceptually divided that question ready to launch into our search strategy. So asking this same question, does this stuff work, is exactly the same as breaking it up like this and we're ready to go to start developing our search strategy based on these four concepts. The same, as I mentioned, can be done with other types of evidence. And here, if we have a question of experiential evidence, experiential evidence, I beg your pardon, where the Joanna Briggs Institute has been a recognised leader in developing these methodologies of synthesis of this type of evidence and their use in systematic reviews, we now talk about the phenomena of interest, which relates to the defined event, activity, experience or process, and we turn to the context rather than comparator. 
an example of asking a question in an answerable format. What are caregivers and our population here, the caregivers who are providing home-based care to persons with HIV AIDS? Our phenomena of interest are the experiences of those caregivers providing home-based care to persons with HIV AIDS and our contact, context here being in Africa. Again, we've asked it in a way that can, with those concepts clearly visible, to be able to help us launch into our search. Now, there are again all sorts of different questions that can be put to systematic review and asked in healthcare. The criteria, while we ask the question in the same way, instantly we know that the types of studies that we should be looking for when we're searching will change based on the question. When I ask a question of the effectiveness of a therapy or an intervention, I'm looking for a causal association. Um, similarly, I actually want to know if I use a particular intervention with a patient, is it going to be harmful or not? But I can't really conduct an experiment to do that. So in these types of reviews, we will start to introduce often, you'll see observational research introduced to actually see what harms occur or adverse events occur in people who are given a particular intervention. Similarly with etiology of disease, we can't measure that experimentally. We just look at observational research. So instantly, depending on the question, some of those eligibility criteria may change. And it's also important to note that whilst a lot of this systematic reviewing kicked off in healthcare and with that first statement by Archie Cochrane back in 1972, now it's being applied across an entire range of fields in agriculture, in developmental studies, they're used in law, they're used in economics, systematic reviews, all that follow the same um, objective criteria to address existing research evidence to inform policy and practice in all these various fields. So, we've asked a question and we use those concepts, those parts of that question now to develop those important eligibility criteria. So, what are the important characteristics of the population? Are we interested in children or adults? Uh, if we're interested in diabetics, is there some aspect of the setting, for example, that's important? Is those um, diabetics who are receiving treatment in the community as opposed to the hospital setting. Um, we've spoken about our intervention, we're talking about a drug. Is it an IV? Is it an oral administration of a particular drug? A comparator, it can be active or passive. Are we comparing it to another drug that's been previously used or simply to a placebo? And of course, the all important outcomes of interest. So these are all derived, and the study type, the appropriate study type, as I just mentioned, directly from that question that's being asked. So you can see how important it is. And, and it is so important for this reason, and this is where librarians will be, also should take the opportunity to guide researchers, because we have this wonderful knack of wanting to do everything. Funders like a lot of a big bang for their buck. They want all their questions answered. Researchers like to be able to answer everything. But the key to a systematic review, to, to a manageable systematic review that will actually provide useful results is often a focused question, like those two that I just showed you, which gives a clear guide to the data that the reviewer will look for and will allow the, the researchers to arrive at clear conclusions versus a broad question where when these are asked, we open up the door to accumulating vast amounts of heterogeneous data that is actually very difficult to synthesise. if We have all different types of study designs. Um, and, and the broader it gets, often the more difficult it is to conduct and the, often the utility of the exercise decreases uh, quite markedly. Some of the other problems that arise at this point, if we aren't making that transition from question to PICO, um, and if uh, these inclusion criteria are poorly defined and the researchers or reviewers fail to follow that process, you, we often see that there's a lack of congruency but sometimes between the review objectives and the questions that are being asked and the results that are being presented. And it really does impact on the output of what really comes out from this research process. I'll give you a brief example. 
here's the aim, essentially the question. We can delve into the question here of a systematic review. The aim of this systematic review is to investigate whether poor sleep quantity and or quality in children and adolescents aged 3 to 18 years is associated with poor dietary intake and behaviours and suboptimal physical activity and sedentary behaviour patterns. So they're basically taking a step back. There's good research evidence and there are systematic reviews, well conducted systematic reviews that show if you have poor sleep quality, the likelihood is you'll be overweight. Okay? You'll have a high BMI. And they're taking a step back to see, does this explain it? The fact that potentially these children have poor dietary behaviour, are they binge eating for example, or are they not exercising as a result of the fact they're not sleeping well? So a question for systematic review. And here's what the, the PICO, the eligibility criteria look like. A clear description of the participants, healthy children aged 3 to 18 years, excluded with comorbidities. Now we get to the intervention. Now in this case, it's not really an intervention, it's more an exposure. And remember, we're looking for that association between poor sleep and um, these, these outcomes uh, of sedentary behaviour, physical activity and dietary behaviour. And here, um, so the sleep architecture and dietary patterns we actually missed the physical activity in this case, but most importantly, here's where alarm bells start ringing in terms of not following that PICO mnemonic and the concepts that it helps researchers deal with. The primary outcome measures were sleep quantity, quality, dietary intake, physical activity, etc. This isn't actually the outcome of interest in this association. Here there's been a mix up of the dependent and the independent variables. This is the exposure. And what I'd expect to see with this question is sleep quantity measured here as the exposure. It might be in a particular number of hours per night, or it might be in quantiles of sleep. So little, a moderate amount, and lots of sleep, which might be greater than eight hours. Moderate amount might be five to eight hours and less than five hours might be a little sleep. And that I'd expect to see an association then with dietary behaviours and physical behaviours. And because of that mix up how the results presented to us in the review. Of the seven studies included five reported activity and sleep related outcomes and five dietary and sleep related outcomes. But me as a reader, I have no idea which way this association has gone. Did the poor sleep lead to Physical, acti physical activity one way or the other? Or was it the lack of physical activity that led to poor sleep? Or too much physical activity that led to poor sleep? Similarly, was it dietary behaviours that arose from poor sleep or vice versa? You actually don't know. And you don't know in reading the report either. The majority of studies were excluded for not measuring the outcome of interest. Or was that the sleep? or was it the dietary behaviour or the physical activity? You don't know, and that all arises simply from this mix-up in concept right here in moving from that question through to these eligibility criteria.